Hey everybody, welcome to the April 18th uh, meeting of the Instructional Committee of the Concord School Board. Um, instructional Committee members present are Sarah Robinson, Jonathan Weinberg, and myself. Um, Brenda Hastings is not here tonight. Um, and we have a room full of people covering all sorts of things, Project C, World Language, Data Review, and Professional Development. So without further ado, the first item on the agenda is Project C presentation. Okay. So yay. <laughs> Pull your microphone close okay. and have at it. All right. So I, I'm going to just introduce you. This oh, is thank you. Stephanie Bowser, and she oversees the Project C program and has three program assistants that work with her. And she's just going to provide a brief overview. Um, and this, ironically, was on the agenda um, when we created it in August and September. So it's timely, um, and thanks. OK. Well, nice to see you all. Um, I am going to be sharing with you about Project C, which is a district elementary science enrichment program um, that's been in the district for 53 years now. Um, so before I do that, I just do want to give a big shout out to the board, a thank you for finding room in the budget for our program assistance um, this time around. So we are, are very grateful. Um, so Project C is, a, C stands for Science um, and Environmental Education, and it is a program that was established uh, back in 1970, so when the environmental movement was really blossoming in this country, Project C was, was formed, as it, we share the birthday of the first Earth Day, as well as the Clean Air Act. Um, I and was in this school at that time. Uh, really? Okay. Mrs. is Tchaikovsky. It's the best <laughs> class ever. So, yeah. So, if you, you, yeah, I will mention Edwina, and um, she is a legend yeah. for right sure. Right here is where we had it. We yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So, originally the program was founded under Audubon, and then it was later adopted by the Concord School District. In 1981, the state of New Hampshire leased um, about 28 acres of land to the Concord School District. Um, out on South Clinton Street, and that's where the uh, White Farm is. That land abuts a lot of other conservation land, almost 500 acres of protected lands um, that are considered the green entrance to Concord, and that's where our Project C Learning Center is. Um, and just as an aside, we're also, that building where Project C is, where we do most of our field trips, is also on the historic reg register, so a lot of really great history there. Um, so I wanted to mention some of the leadership throughout the years because um, we've had some really amazing teachers at the helm of the program. Edwina Tchaikovsky, she was uh, the founder of Project C um, and really the visionary um, for what Project C could become for the district. Uh, she was the heart and soul um, and still really is. A lot of people remember her, a lot of teachers too. Um, so she was the leader of Project C until 1998, and then it was taken over by Chris Demers, who we all know and love, for about three years. Um, and then um, it was handed over to Luann Pigeon, who was the pro program coordinator till 2019. Um, and she was my mentor. I worked at Project C for 10 years um, as a program assistant before becoming the coordinator in 2019. Um, so it's worth noting that this program that I love so much and was so excited to lead this hands-on science program, I got in the door and then the pandemic hit. And that great um, online program, um, <laughs> that great hands-on program quickly became an online program because we could not go school to school, of course, during the pandemic um, and we couldn't lead field trips. So we pivoted and reinvented the program um, and that meant making science videos every week. We had to teach ourselves how to do that um, and did 29 weeks of a uh, different science topic every week for our elementary classrooms and then also did um, websites tied to that science topic so that the kids could be doing science learning at home if they were at home or during hybrid learning. Tried to come up with simple activities to keep kids curious and excited about science and tried to find ways that they could also take that science content outdoors and, and do a little bit deeper learning. So it was an interesting time, to say the least. Um, but that brings us to today, where things are much more normal, thank goodness. Um, so today we have a staff of five. So in addition to myself, um, I'm the coordinator, but I'm also a certified middle school science teacher. 
Um, we have two full-time program assistants. That's Madeline Champlin and Hillary Chapman. Um, and then two part-time program assistants, Kathy Kaplan and Mary Fougere. Uh, the, the goals of Project C are threefold. So our goals are to provide Concord students with hands-on, next-generation science-aligned um, science experiences, to develop scientific and environmental awareness that's tied to our local resources here in Concord, and also to inspire our students to become good citizens for our future community um, with strong problem-solving and critical thinking skills. So the Project C model um, is, we're sort of made up of four main parts that I'm gonna try to go through pretty quickly. We're kind of a confusing and complicated program. Um, so we have classroom lessons that we do in each of the elementary schools. We host field trips at the White Farm. Um, we also have connections with some community partners and we support the elementary teachers in their science teaching as well. So in terms of elementary science support, we have 93 elementary classrooms this year, um, and each of those teachers are teaching science in their classroom. They're using um, a curriculum that was chosen by our science committee called Mystery Science. Um, so Project C is really trying to support the teachers in the teaching of that science, providing resources that extend the learning and enhance their, their science teaching experience. Um, we also help to uh, orient new teachers in the district when they come in so that they know how to use that mystery science curriculum. Um, and then the big part that I do is ordering science supplies. Um, there's a lot of supplies needed for those 93 classrooms, so I do the, um, I coordinate the ordering of all those supplies, compile them into kits, and then distribute those to all the classrooms. Um, we also try to form a lot of community partners because I really feel that it's through con connecting to the community that we can provide better real world applied science experiences. So um, these are just a few of our partners. The New Hampshire Energy Education Program provides us with some really amazing science kits for teaching about renewable energy. Um, we work with the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests. Um, we are grade two students. We take them out for a habitat hike on the Merrimack Conservation Lands. Um, our fourth grade students have been working as citizen scientists for almost all of Project C's years, um, collecting data on the hawk migration at their schoolyards. And then um, we submit that data to the Hawk Migration Association of North America. Um, and that is a database of, of um, hawk migration data that's used by scientists around the world. Um, we have a long-standing partnership with the Audubon Society, and then Julie's Happy Hens is a lovely free-range chicken farm down in Mont Vernon that we get fertile eggs from for our first grades to raise uh, chickens in the classroom. Um, and then we have a, uh, a budding partnership with the Sycamore Community Gardens, which has turned out to be a really great partnership. Um, we give, allow teachers to have the opportunity, if they wish, to raise plants in the classroom with their students so they get that science experience, but then we donate the, the plants to the community gardens to be planted by um, community members. And this year we've started working with them to also do some work days with our fifth graders to help um, prep the gardens. And there's a lot of great science learning that can come from that as well. Uh, the classroom. So this is a, a, a sample schedule I threw in there for you of what a month of classroom experience, classroom lessons with Project C looks like. We rotate through all of the elementary schools. And when we go into those classrooms, um, we go to grades one and two once a month to teach science lessons. And then we go into grades three, four, and five twice per month. When we go in, um, Project C program assistants are covering all the classrooms at a particular grade level at the same time. And what that does is it frees up the teachers to be able to leave the rooms and go out and have grade level meeting time um, and prof professional development time. Normally that's with Chantel DiNapoli doing OGAP training. So, um, 
in terms of our classroom, what we're teaching, um, we try to stick to real hands-on um, lessons. Um, and we do a lot of cooperative learning as well, where we have kids working on teams to do their science lessons. And that's just a few pictures of some of um, our classroom lessons. Now the field trips are sort of the foundation of Project C. They're what we've been doing from the beginning out at the White Farm. It's what we're really known for. Um, we offer two field trips a year to each grade level K to five. Um, we hold those mostly at the White Farm property, but we also do field trips out in the community as well at some of our conservation lands. We end up hosting about 200 field trips every year. So quite a lot of field trips that we're offering right here in Concord for our students. And what makes them unique is that the field trips, um, teachers are present for the field trips as well. So we're able to share some um, kind of different science instructional techniques with them that they could use in their classroom. Um, and parents attend as well as chaperones. Um, which is a really cool connection. Um, as Kim and I were talking about today, we, we hear these great stories from parents all the time who were students in the Concord School District and went on these field trips when they were kids and now they're here with their own kids. And so it's a, it's a great kind of connection through time. So this is just a glance at what our year looks like in terms of field trips. Those field trips are run by myself as well as our two full-time program assistants. Um, and the best way to, to show you those field trips is really to show you pictures. So I brought lots of pretty pictures, um, which I will show you. Um, I'm just gonna kind of not talk and just go through these so you can see starting at the kindergarten level and then going on up through the grades. This is one of our oldest field trips, by the way, Backyard that's a, that's Birds. Kim chickadee. knows it well. Yeah, that's, that's a, a chickadee on top like of her head. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a chickadee on top of that hat. I don't know if you can see that there. Best part of first grade, Ken. The chicks. Yeah. yeah. Walker School again. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You, you know so, these? Yeah. I love it. This is the best we got to see Mr. D is at White Farm. Yeah. This is another one we've been doing for a lot of years out on the Merrimack River. For this is my personal favorite, the for wetlands. Stu for students um, in the height of the pandemic who did not have access to these, is there any like retroactive, like students can participate in upcoming years? No, we really don't have room okay. in the schedule to do that. So we tried to do some things like, um, for example, this past month, we, I added a unit on science careers in fifth grade, and they couldn't go on this wetlands field trip. And so I brought live plankton into the, all the fifth grade classrooms so that they'd have that opportunity to look at them under the microscope. So that was That's me cool. knowing retroacti act, retroactively that they didn't get that experience and trying to still give it to them. So Thank you. I also yeah. should load up on science electives, freshwater ecology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're giving Let's them teasers. teasers. <laughs> totally, like retroactive five years later. Yeah. Yeah. As a special educator in my years at Walker School, 15 years there, so accompanying classrooms on these field trips a lot for my kids, so mm -hmm. to speak. The best part about these activities is that sometimes children that don't shine academically in a classroom are the stars of the day that here. That is absolutely it, true and yeah. it's one of the joys for us to yes. see because we do see kids in the classroom right. um, but then we see them on the field trips and that is and that's where they can show what they know always the case. Yes. and they know so much more than yeah it's I loved incredible it. yeah yeah it's incredible yeah. to see a, kids being able to learn in a different way yeah. um, in a different setting and being able to shine where they might not always in the classroom. Is there still a hot convention? Is that? Oh, no. Oh, oh that was also the best. That was the best. So, T-shirts. <laughs> no. Turkey vulture, turkey vulture. I know. It ended just before I took over as coordinator. So the teachers, um, their schedules are so very yeah, yeah, it's full. Not, it's too bad. That, you know, it used to be we did thematic units with yeah. Project C. Um, the field trip would be the culmination, but they, the teachers would be teaching the same content in the classroom. Right. But now with the adoption of you know a separate curriculum and all the other demands that teachers have yeah. upon them, they can't all, some of them do still teach about hawks in the classroom. Not all of them are able to do that unit though. 
And so this oh my God, that was what identified fourth grade years ago. That in New Hampshire history. <laughs> that was we it was we incredible. watched the Hawks on the roof of Kimball School when I was in yeah. fourth grade. Oh yeah, I did that. Fly yeah. anymore? <laughs> but <laughs> let's go on a roof of an old building and look for birds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we still do the citizen science, and I and I yeah. and they they just love it. Yeah. They just love it. My fourth yeah. grader did that this year and really did like it quite a lot. Yeah. Like, just eyes glued. I wish we could do more. Yeah. I wish we could do that full unit with them. But. And my second grader is making oblek. Oh yeah, all that the was, time. That, yeah, that was I the uh, what's the matter? Going through cornstarch like you wouldn't believe. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very fun. I enjoy it too. <laughs> That's our gardens at the at the cottage. And that's out on conservation lands around Concord. And then this is our grand finale that we do every year with grade six. Um, we don't I went on do, that one. That was yeah, amazing. it's with, an amazing all day yeah. field trip. It's a big, long field trip. And it's big sort of, it's our last time we get, yeah. to get to see them too. It's a pretty special trip, field trip. Hmm. All right, so looking to the future. Um, so as you know, there's gonna be a large need for um, people with that are science literate and, and going into these careers. Um, they're estimating that by 2030, there's going to be 80 million STEM jobs that need to be filled. So we have to get kids prepared. And um, I really believe that it's programs like Project C that are gonna give kids the skills, the real hands-on skills, and the confidence and the experience to see themselves as future scientists and um, hopefully go into these careers. Um, and we hope that, um, you know, it's, there's, I think we've really all felt a disconnection, um, maybe between each other, but also to the natural world over the last few years. And um, my hope is that with Project C, we can continue to connect kids to the natural world by providing these hands-on, really locally tied um, science experiences um, that will continue to provide a tie between the community and the district so that kids can experience science and take what they're learning in the classroom and apply it to new situations and real world situations. Um, and that we'll continue to support our teachers as best we can. Um, they are, as you know, superheroes, all of you. Um, and what they have to manage in an elementary classroom is an incredible amount of responsibility. And so if we can continue to support them and make science a teaching a little bit easier and more engaging, then I hope that we'll be able to do that. Um, I'm just gonna leave you with this quote, which um, for me sums up the, the beauty of Project C. Uh, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. Um, and I feel really grateful that I still get this chance to continue um, inspiring kids and, and making, helping to make that connection. So, thank you. So, Barb, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I just also want to acknowledge um, Stephanie. There's this email from um, the uh, New Hampshire Environmental Educators, Stephanie. It says, wow, the New Hampshire Environmental Educators Board was blown away by your commitment to getting your students outdoors and interested, curious about science and nature. The website that was created to engage students during COVID is very impressive, and your dedication to helping teachers to get their students outside is inspiring. We are thrilled to let you know that you have been chosen to be the 2023 Environmental Educator of the Year. Congratulations! So I'm going to get teary right now. I cry at these things. Thank you. <laughs> That was awesome. A million memories going through my head right now. Yeah. From students yeah. to teacher to parents. It's pretty special. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's amazing. It's yeah, thank you for the work that you do. We really thank appreciate you. it. Congratulations. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, all right, so world language. Yeah, pressure's on now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bar. <laughs> so, so it's Rebecca Tanfried and team. So raise your hand if you're here as a language person. And just, I'm going to start here, and we'll just go around and just put the mic to your name and let everyone know who you are. Okay. That'd be great. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm Katie McDonough, and I teach Latin at the high school and at the middle school. Great. Wendy Lachtim. I teach Spanish at the high school. Um, I'm Becky Tankreed. I'm the curriculum facilitator for social studies and world language at the high school. Great. Jim Corkum. I'm an assistant principal at the high school, and I oversee world language. Hi, I'm Laura Pruitt, and I teach Spanish at Concord High. I'm Alice Sakturski, and I teach Latin at the high school. Uh, and I'm Sarah Hayes. I teach German at Runlet 
uh, and at Concord High, and I also coordinate our German American Partnership Program, our exchange program. Nice, nice. Walker School alumni, oh, just had to put that in. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you can talk about Walker School. All right, so it's all you. Okay, so um, this slideshow feels longer than I think we were hoping that it would be. So we're gonna share it, <laughs> no, right? A little? I don't know. Um, so uh, I'm not gonna go through every everything on it, but I'm gonna, gonna share go it with you all because there's links and stuff. So if you wanna go back and look at anything, yeah. by all means. Okay. Um, so just a little overview of what we're gonna talk about: just general information and enrollment trends for world language. Um, the competencies that we use, um, what we offer at the middle school and at the high school, and then what we offer beyond the classroom, and then sort of what we're hoping to see in the future. Um, and then just some general information. So currently, World Language is a 7 to 12 department. Um, World Language begins in the seventh grade. Um, we have 11 teachers um, that teach, again, through Runlet and at the, up at the high school. Um, so first, it's like the boring stuff, just some numbers. Um, this is World Language enrollment data for, it's kind of backwards, but the, the first column is 2023, 2024. So these are the signups at the high school for next year. I don't have the numbers for eighth grade yet. Um, and then we sort of go back in time a little bit. So um, for t the current year at CHS and at RMS, the RMS numbers are for eighth grade. Um, every seventh grader takes world language in the exploratory class, but eighth graders get to choose what language they want to go into. So these are the numbers. Um, that go back in time to 2019, 2020. Um, and then if just to look at it a little bit differently, if it's easier, um, here are some graphs. So the graph on the left, upper left, is the runlet enrollment in world language. Um, and it goes by language. So the blue bar is 2018, 2019. The orange is um, 2022, 2023, so this academic year. And then this is the CHS enrollment. And at the bottom, this is overall Concord School District enrollment. So this is enrollment at Runlet, and this is enrollment at CHS for the same years. Um, I don't, there is, the data wasn't there for um, 2022, 2023 yet. Um, but just, just to look at, you know, the trends are sort of matching up slightly. Um, but just some information there. And I do, the link to the, so more information is also available. And then these are what we're currently running. So at every, again, every language is offered in the seventh grade year and then um, these are the the other ones so level one at runlet is we run four sections of spanish french german etc etc um the point fives are we run a french four or five class and then we also run a latin four or five class so kids can take that twice um technically if they're level four and then level five um, we just don't have the numbers to run individual classes so that's how we've managed it and the teachers have been pretty awesome because they're essentially running in some cases, two classes sort of in one room. Um, but they manage it, and it's good, and we're keeping kids in foreign language, so it's awesome. Um, we're obviously Concord's a competency ba Concord High School is competency-based. Um, the World Language Department uses ACTFL, which is the American Council on Teaching Foreign Languages. Um, their competencies are based on ACTFL's proficiency standards, and there are um, sort of three categories. Uh, the first is communication, obviously. Um, communication, um, every language except for Latin does all three of these. Latin doesn't do interpersonal communication because they don't speak to each other in Latin. <laughs> but they do presentations and they do um, read text in Latin. Um, so they do um, presentational interpretive and then the other three spoken languages do all three of these. And then every language also has a culture competency. And then Latin adds on connections and comparisons. So a little different, but these competencies are also standard for all of our classes. So whether you're in Spanish 1 or German 4 or Latin 3, the competencies are the same. So kids are, are doing similar things in all of the world language classes, which is a step in the right direction that we've worked really hard to get to in the last few years. Any questions? I feel like I'm talking so fast. You were so well paced. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing wonderfully. I okay, love a fast talk. Yeah. We might, so I yeah. think you might be getting to this. German enrollment was something that was the most staggering because it dropped exponentially. Is that due to students just enrollment in general numbers? I know they've been declining, or has there been some other theme? Um, I think, I, I don't know if you want to answer that, Becky, if you want me to answer that. Go ahead. Um, I think generally, I mean, we do have that general enrollment going down. Also, we had. Uh, a bit of a drop. There was one year where we were teaching that world language exploratory course during a different time than obviously on Zoom. Um, and uh, we saw pretty, I think that's the, 
I'm looking right. That green arrow, the one that's yeah. way down, that was that was a huge that's drop right that year. Yeah. Um, uh, that we saw, and I think those numbers are, are still in the process of recovering. Um, I started teaching that class last year, so I'm still learning the ropes mm -hmm. and how to brainwash the kids into taking German. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's um, awesome. that's why I think. Thank you. Yeah. And at any time, if anyone wants to jump in, please, by all means. Um, so what we offer, so the seventh grade exploratory program, and again, if anyone who teaches it wants to jump in and cut me off, feel free. Um, and if I mess something up, correct me. Uh, <laughs> so the, the seventh grade program runs quarters one, two, and three, and kids, every seventh grader takes two weeks with each language. And um, they just, God bless them, they rotate through the same curriculum every two weeks uh, with a new, a new group of, of students. Um, and it only runs through quarter three because by the end of quarter three, so um, early to mid-April, kids are picking their, eight, their language for their eighth grade year. So that's actually been an improvement. It used to be that it would go through quarter four and there would be this whole group of kids that hadn't taken the language exploratory yet and they were just choosing a language at random. But now all the kids have seen all of them. Yeah, that's um, great. So they get to make yeah. their choice um, based on what they actually like, which is awesome. Um, it's super introductory. Obviously, it's only two weeks long. Um, so it's fun, just quick introductions. And then at, in the eighth grade is where they get the chance to take a full year of a level one language class. It's the same level one class that runs at the high school. It's oftentimes taught by the same teacher, uh, which is pretty cool. And um, in the upcoming academic year, the goal is to get more kids in those classes. So right now we know that there are about 100 students in eighth grade who don't take world language right now. Um, about 50 of them are receiving special ed services. Um, so it's hard to fit more academic classes in their schedule. But then there's another 50 or so that are in what's called a guided study and because of a variety of factors the guidedness of that study has has been lacking a little bit so they're really trying to get kids in, into world language classes it would be a great experience for them so we're actually hoping some of those numbers will naturally start ticking up a little bit um you know if those 50 kids find a language they really love in eighth grade then they stick with it through the years then that would be awesome for the program and for them and for everyone else uh, or hopefully more than 50 kids a number of that other group too Quick question mm -hmm. for, and I, I know this has happened in math departments, I believe, when students were more proficient and, and I think took geometry at the high school. Is that ever an instance with languages? If a student, for example, could take um, Spanish 2 or Latin mm. 2, and is that an option? I don't, as to my knowledge, it hasn't happened, it hasn't happened. but there's no re there's nothing in to say grade? that it couldn't. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah there it, was, it hasn't happened in eighth grade. I I think we've done it once or twice with German. It has to be okay. in, in consultation with the rest of the department. Um, and the student would go up and like start the day, like let's say at, at a period one class for level two at the high school okay. and come yeah. back. Um, we also let kids jump ahead depending on, again, in consultation with the teacher and evaluating their competency level. Um, I think in Spanish that's happened too. I remember Sam Lance a few week, few years ago. I think it just happened in French. French too. There's yeah. a young woman who's in French. I think she skipped French three. Yeah. She was first French. She was drugged. She's really ahead. Thank you. Nice. Oh, was it? I'm sorry. Cut you right off. <laughs> um, so we, the introductory levels of language are really levels one and level two. Um, there's just a list of things that happen in there, games, songs, recreation, uh, reading. Hi, sorry. It's my first time reading, apparently. Um, daily life, there's a lot of culture taught in level one and level two. Um, and then the upper levels, three, four, and five. Uh, a little less structured, um, more um, target language instruction and, and expectation, especially once you get up to level four and five, an expectation of, of much more in the target language, um, which is awesome. So, and that sort of rounds out our language program. We have offered um, like independent studies in the past that take it beyond level five, but level five is the highest level that we offer currently um, at Concord High School. And these are links to all sorts of like student projects and videos and things like that. So like I said, I'd be happy to share this with you after in case people want to share. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what is the National Latin exam and the National German exam? Ah. Um, you go first. Ah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those, for the National Latin exam, um, it's an exam offered, um, it's a standardized test offered to levels one through five of Latin students. Um, that kids, actually I think one through six, some schools have level six, um, that all schools around the country can take to kind of see where they are um, and it, it offers kids who do well scholarship money um, and it's the kind of thing they can put on their 
um, college applications and that sort of thing. Same with German. It's offered by the American Association for Teachers of German. Um, and uh, students working with authentic texts, native speakers, listening, um, reading, and viewing. Um, I actually just had my kids take, my eighth graders take it today. Um, I think they did really well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So beyond the classroom, uh, there's a lot of things kids can do to get involved in world language at the high school. Specifically, I don't, I'm not actually super keen on what clubs are like at the middle school, but at the high school there's a lot of opportunities um, that in include clubs. Uh, just today I was walking out of the building and I <laughs> there was a parade of kids in party hats and then uh, someone was carrying a, a um, what is it? Uh, what was it? The thing you hit? We had a pinata. Pinata. And then she came around the corner with a hockey stick. I'm like, Latin club? It was Latin club. Um, it was Latin club. Yeah. <laughs> so there are a lot of It's Rome's birthday this week. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It was The kids had a great time out in that little courtyard. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and then Alice was out there holding onto it while kids were talking. It was a lot. It was no, really, no one was hurt. Yeah. No, it was really true. <laughs> it went to Spanish <laughs> culture to get a pinata for the Latin, but Rome's birthday. Yeah. yeah. Like right. multicultural. Oh, oh, of right. course. Right. We all support it each other. It can only happen in Concord, New Hampshire. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and it was funny, too, because I saw uh, several students that I knew. There were probably, what, 15 kids there? Yep. And I saw several kids that I know, and I was asking Katie about specific ones. I was like, oh, you know, this student takes Latin. And she's like, no, she just comes to the club. <laughs> OK, well, so everyone was just very welcoming. Uh, so a lot of opportunities to get involved in clubs at Concord High School um, for each language. Um, and then travel opportunities. Um, so obviously we have the GAP program. Sarah, I don't know if you want to say a couple words about the GAP program? Sure. Um, so Concord has had uh, GAP or um, the German-American Partnership Program. Uh, we've been partnered with a school over in Wegberg, Germany um, since 1981, so over 40 years. Um, we've been going back to the same school every two years. Around 25 Concord High students are matched up with 25 uh, German students at this school. It's a two-year process. Uh, we host those 25 students here in Concord for um, for a month, and then uh, the following in the fall, and then the following June, we go over to uh, Germany for a month, and we really view it as the capstone of um, uh, Concord's German program because what's more of a assessment of competency than good luck surviving Germany with a, with a German speaking family for a month. So um, I'm a product of that program. Um, it's what I think a lot of kids really seek that authentic um, use of the language and getting to live as a German for a month. Cool. Um, and then there's a trip to El Salvador. Is that every year? It's been happening. It's actually affiliated with Bishop Brady High School. So we've had students that have gone with them. They yep. go for a week and they work with a family. Um, poverty-stricken areas, they build a home. It's been a really great experience for the kids. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then I don't know a ton about the NS. Nisley? I yes. can talk about Nisley if no one Yeah, <laughs> by all means, <laughs> please. They, they rejected me, unfortunately. When I oh. Oh. It's then a very, I know. Take it off the side. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But it's a very great program where the US government pays for you to study a foreign language in a foreign country. And it's very competitive, but a great program. Yeah, cool. Thanks. I, I know a few Concord High kids, I think, got it when I was there as well. Cool. Um, and then there have been trips to other countries that world language teachers have hosted in the past. Um, obviously, that hasn't happened in a while because of COVID and uh, various other reasons. But um, there's a trip planned in 2024? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. So more, more to come. Exciting. Uh, yeah. So exciting. And then vision for the future. Um, the big one. Do a couple things. Yeah. So for this upcoming year, um, for the first time, um, we are going to be able to have a, a world language coordinator um, for somebody who's working in both buildings. One of the big challenges within the program is, um, you know, the, the program is really overseen at the high school um, by a high school facilitator, high school administrator, but so many of our staff are also going between Runlet and the high school. Um, and a lot of times with scheduling and, and teachers traveling back and forth, um, it's just a, a major barrier in making sure we're having a, a nice aligned vision for the department from 6 through 12 or 7 through 12. Um, so this year using um, you know, the, the, our existing staff that we have in the department that we are going to have a coordinator for someone who is working in both buildings. It's gonna actually going to be Katie McDonough, um, who is going to help coordinate, um, <laughs> coordinate our, our instruction and, and, our, and our world language um, between the middle school and the high school and hopefully um, expanding that at, with years to come. Nice. So exciting. Yeah, social studies really just destroyed him. And now, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I was, I was a, yeah, I've just been really, I'm just really glad for them. It's been a lot to be a coordinator for a department that you, you're not a part of. So I'm just happy that. She's I'm just, I'm just very happy that you guys get your person next year. Um, I am. I'm happy for you. Um, um, expansion. So 
the goal would be at least to expand through sixth grade. So to get into every grade level at Runlet would be a great first step in expansion. And with the six to 12 coordinator, that could be a possibility. So um, that would be awesome. There's also the seal of biliteracy, which we haven't done yet as a school. Um, but it's not a super intricate process to take on. So we're hoping that maybe in the future we can do that. Um, and then at the high school, there's been a push towards pathways. Um, and some of our uh, department members have brought up like if we could offer semester long language courses specific to a pathway. So like Spanish for healthcare workers or you know, That's whatever. Oh, oh, yeah, so just here. some really cool um, ideas for the future. Um, so that's that's that, and that's that's all I got. Thank you so much. Nice. Yeah, Wonderful sure. Stuff. Thank you all for the work that you're doing. You had a question? A few questions. I know we're on a time constraint, so I'll try to. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I won't. So level five um, language courses. Do those align with AP exams, like the curriculum? Uh, no, they no. don't. They don't. Nope. No. Okay. And that I think has been, and you guys can back me up. I think it's been a conscious choice by okay. the department not to. Um, we we revisit it. I would say pretty much every year we talk about it, um, but it's been kind of a conscious choice not to. But I believe also um, students have opted to take the AP exam. Oh yes, they, they can still take the exam. Yeah. Yep. So. Awesome. Uh, for sixth grade, if it were to expand, would that mean full grade for seventh? with budget implications, or is that just exploratory for both sixth and seventh grade? I don't think we're even at the point. Not I, even I, at yeah, the, okay. I, yeah, it's really Hold just it. like vision, big picture, would love to get to sixth mm -hmm. grade, but like that's really just a vision at this point. Mm -hmm. And for vision, big picture, are there any other languages that, that like Chinese or yeah, et cetera, that we have thought cool about have, adding? So we probably are coming to the time where we should survey the students. We did it probably about four or five years ago um, and, and gave a survey to students in terms of what languages are we not offering that maybe we should offer. Um, and I can remember Chris Herr, who was the um, uh, facilitator at the time, we went and, um, and visited a few schools who were offering um, some Chinese programs. But the, the, the student need or request just wasn't necessarily there at the time um, to really to bring forward for our course requests. Um, but it's not to say that we shouldn't relook at that, revisit um, another one that again just wasn't quite at that level of bringing in another, um, bringing in a section or a course was um, American Sign Language, um, which could be, which is another option. So those are things that we should also bring to the table and see what that student interest is. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> all right, that was excellent. I have Thank you all wonderful so memories of my foreign language times at Concord High. <laughs> <laughs> trip, to, trip to Germany, down in the salt mines, into the castles. <laughs> all right. Tom can tell you what an awesome experience it was for German with his daughter in oh, yeah. last year. Yeah, she loved her eighth grade year of German. It was one of her favorite, favorite things to do. <laughs> and she's already planning on uh, going to on the gap trip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, so number three, now that we've done like science and more language, we could talk about some data. Um, Tom thought the meeting was Monday and was fully ready to present to you <laughs> at uh, five o'clock. Well, I called That's it the it 18th and it's actually the 19th, so yes. we're plugged into the same toaster. Well, I just want you to know, I wasn't here. But, I was. but you were fully prepared. Oh, yeah. yeah, you Thank all you. Oh, Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Thank you, unless you want to stay. Unless you well. want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> fun yeah. yeah. Dad, forget your family. Yeah. Yeah. Stay yeah. Sit here and listen to you, all right? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Yeah, nice thank you so thank very much. Sarah. Appreciate you all. I will. Wale. Wale. Happy to say. Goodbye, I know of Spasiba. I know nothing Tom, Russian. Yeah. Okay. No, we're good. We're, we're still on the same team. Is that I want a drink. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we are on TV. Yeah, we are on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so data, <laughs> numbers, numbers yes. never lie. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you to Kim and Kathleen for, um, I so, sort of, and John, um, but more directly, I support them in getting them the data that we need. 
um, to help kids. And the most fun part of this job, if you tell somebody you're assessment coordinator, they're like, that sounds bad. That sounds boring. <laughs> um, speaking to one of my neighbors. And what I say is I look at all 5,000 kids in the district and try and find a way for each of them to get the help that they need. That's the fun part. I don't do it myself, but I try and match them up um, in helping Kathleen and John and, and Kim do this work. Um, so we, did you want to say anything before we started, Kim, or? Um, I just didn't want to. You know, I just I, I just wanted to, you know thank the board for the request to have this data presented, and um, it's not as early as we would have liked it to be, you know, pre-budget. However, um, our we have done we do triannual data visits to every single school and review attendance data, social emotional math, ELA data, and it it takes a long time. It's a half of a day at every building, mm. you know, all six buildings. So it's, um, it takes time. It takes about two months to do that and complete it. So I really appreciate, appreciate Tom's great mind because he really is able to um, compile the data in a way that was beyond anything that I could ever do and um, provide our, this is essentially our mid-year data. So you need to think about it as um, December, January benchmarks. So we're now in April, so it's not current at this point. We'll do another retreat in June, where we'll do an end of the year with the administrators and reading specialists and math coaches. Great. Yeah. And go ahead, John. And I would just add from, uh, you know, this is where we really partner. And I think that, you know, Kim and I are kind of the both sides of, of, of the world in a lot of the way we work, you know, between curriculum instruction and, and, and student services. And I think what this does is blends them both. Gives us a good overall picture of growth where we are, but then dives down to where are those uh, students that qualify for Title I and need Title I services and do some of these things. And it helps us then take this mid-year data and look at, okay, now for our uh, extended school year programs and our Title I programs, who are we inviting and what do they need? And it helps us really um, be very organized and purposeful about the instruction we need for students. Is what, is what Tom's work does. It really helps us make some of these decisions. So it's a real nice partnership between us to do some of this work. Awesome. Well, I've tried to, um, I've, I've tried to be mindful of the length because if we go to all six or seven schools, that winds up with about two and a half hours at each school. And so I didn't want to present all that to you because obviously that would be a gargantuan amount. Um, I will say that um, I credit um, Kathleen's idea to bring these back, um, but Kim and John's commitment to actually being there and taking that much time for an administrator to, to listen, and both of them have shown me to be great listeners um, as, as they've gone through this, and I know for my own part, I know more about the district than I ever have from doing this last year and this year. It, it can feel like, oh my gosh, we've done this for, month and a half, but when you really sit with it, you really have a good understanding um, of what's going on. So data has become, we used to do way back 15, 20 years ago, data retreats just in the summer. Right. So we would look at data, we'd put it all together in boxes of paper and look at it in the summer. And data, looking at data has really become a continual process. We have schools that, you know, Chantel, who helps with a ton of this, Dinapoli, she meets regularly with um, math teachers about what was the data from last week and what are we gonna do about it. Mm -hmm. So that has really improved. Um, like Kim said, we talked about attendance, social, emotional. Um, we won't get into discipline here, but we talked about it at the schools. Um, and uh, we'll talk about ELA and math. Really simply put, the schools are looking for where are the students now, where do we want them to be, and how are we gonna get them there? And some of the goals, like there are some goals that schools pick, like let's get everyone to 70%. And you might say, well that doesn't, why not go for 100? Um, and so there are some goals that were realistically based on, you know, this, this group really got hit hard because of X, and that's a realistic goal to make. Um, so that's a part of it as well. Mm -hmm. Here's an example. This is how detailed the teachers and leaders in these buildings got. So a fluency, math fluency, what's six times seven? And you know it immediately. Um, 
this goal, 100% of our students will show growth in their total number of known facts with an increased focus on addition doubles and multiplication times two facts. So if you think about, and there's, a, there's one for, um, for reading, grade five, 70% of students will be on target with their reading level U. We use Fountas and Pinnell. It has literacy levels from A to Z. The farther you are towards Z, the better of a reader or more capable you are. So these are some examples of the, the types of specificity that they went to and that they checked in on themselves in February. If you think about putting all these together for each grade, there's about 30 math goals and 30 ELA goals, but that's not spread all over the place. They're really directed at, if we're going to improve math as a whole, let's filter it down in each, each little grade, each area, even going down into what do students with uh, special education needs or other needs um, need. So they might have a specific goal for their subgroup. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, some other examples of elementary, uh, just general, talking about fact fluency, that again are do you know your math facts um, right away. Um, we've moved away from memorization in, may, in many fronts, but you know, factually knowing, like letter sounds, um, letter ID, that sort of thing is important to being able to go further. Um, the, we obviously, we noticed last year that subtraction was an issue throughout the grades. Um, and so the coaches made that a definite point. Let's make sure we're working on uh, subtraction. Uh, fractions also, when you get to fractions in the later elementary grades, that was a, a focus as well. And we really tried um, in year two of the coaches, really tried to fine tune that already uh, pretty fine tuned machine. Uh, we even went, we were able to go see Jim Knight, who's a nationwide coaching expert uh, down at the Group Pony Center. Um, and so that was a good, uh, good part of our goal as well. RMS seems very simple, but they, they wanted to focus in, think about everything they're doing, and they wanted to see 80% of students meet their iReady growth goal by the end of the year. Um, and CHS math, SA, math SAT scores and reading SAT scores are below the state average, um, unfortunately. And Mike Reardon was really clear, Kathleen as well, Kim as well, um, that we want to improve those scores. One of the things they did, since we don't have as much data for them yet, is they had everybody take the PSAT and looked at uh, practice for anyone that they could get to do some practice. Um, obviously, their coursework um, prepares them for the SAT. But they also looked at, um, there's a report from the PSAT that says these kids are really close to making uh, the college ready level on the SAT. And so we really reached out, Kylene Chaloskas reached out individually to those kids to make sure that they were definitely getting uh, that support. Ooh, I forgot to delete that side. So here's an example, um, and I won't show all of them, um, but so kindergarten, their goal was 90% of students will count up to a beyond 30. In February, they checked that back in, 81% of students are there. 100% of students will accurately identify numeral zero to 10. They're at 95%, <coughs> they wanted 100. Same with the one below. Those red squiggles are just me taking the kids' names off. Um, but these are examples, so even within kindergarten, you see there are actually three goals <laughs> related to kindergarten. So this is the type of thing that we did in those uh, two hour long data meetings. We really went grade by grade, goal by goal, and looked at where students were. Were these, is their goal by February 90% of students or end of year? It was by February. By February, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So they're gonna hope that they'll get, they each came with another goal that they shared, mm -hmm. and Kim actually took amazing notes as we were doing the meetings. And so she took notes on each school, so we can look at, I don't know if you want to say more about that, but you sort of see the, the themes that are uh, arising. Yeah, I think one thing that was really beneficial out of this was that we then um, pulled together what we call a 
professional learning team with the administrators and we took the data and everyone shared their data, their school data, or I presented the data mm -hmm. that across the entire district because we're not just one building, we're a community of learners. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important for us to know and to be able to see like, oh, you set that goal, oh, you set that goal, maybe I, should, maybe I need to be some, maybe I need to align mine. Some of the goals that were set were end of the year goals and some mm -hmm. were in February and then readjusted according to performance. Mm -hmm. Is there a starting point, like we got to February and we got to 81%, where were we the first time, you know, when we assessed to set that goal? Yeah, they definitely did have that, um, and it's included in every, so the first triennial meeting, okay. or the first data meeting, that's what they shared, and that's where they were setting their goal from summer work, right. and then checking in on where they were, okay. and then making the goal. And so that's why um, if, if they had come in at, only 3% of students being able to do that. Yeah, that would be huge. Their goal might not have been right. realistic. Um, and so what they're always looking for is, and, and what we've heard from you all, is our kids at least make it a year's worth of growth. Because if they're at least making a year's right. worth of growth, they're not falling behind. If we can get them to more, we want to do that. Because if you can get them beyond a year's growth for a couple years in a row, then you build back to um, being, yeah. being on grade level or do, closer to Do it. you have those initial percentages? I do. Um, what would be, I mean, I could put it, I've been working on a way to share it in a grid, so I could share that with you. Yeah. I think yeah. it's also like, I find this to be really promising that they actually got so close to their goals. I mean, it's really impressive. Well, that. this is just one example. Yeah. But I think if we look at the, um, we'll get yeah. to, we'll get to school wide or district wide. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get without sharing ninety seven slides with you. What <laughs> is the story of where the district is right now? Okay. And they they set goals that were. Um, not adventurous, help me out. They ambitious. were ambitious, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Aggressive. Jonathan should have been my teacher, not, <laughs> not the other way around. Um, so they set ambitious goals. I would say in general, and Kim, John, Kathleen, you can, they, they either got close um, or fell a little bit short for February. So I'd say that, that's about where we are. Some of them um, maybe were too ambitious, maybe were just right. Um, but I would say if I had to summarize the whole district, um, they got close, but are probably a little behind what they hoped for in February. Okay. So. Um, that and, doesn't sound like failure to me. <laughs> yeah. 94 is an A. <laughs> um, so let's look at the whole district. Um, I'm much more cynical. <laughs> what, what you're going to see is, this is I ready they have these five levels. So the lowest level is that hash, hash marked red, the highest level is the green. Um, so we're comparing the beginning of the school year. This is everybody in math. And you see there's a little, uh, there's a smaller line beneath the bigger line. Mm -hmm. And what you want to happen there is you want the red to get smaller and you want the green to get bigger as you go from the smaller line up to the bigger. So number in operations, um, those 1,097 students, they're growing in that area. Oh, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. um, algebraic thinking, they're growing in that area, measurement of data, so forth and so on. But if you look at the red, they're still not, I mean, we want that red to go away uh, in a perfect world. And so we're, we're not getting there, but we're growing. I, I would say the other story of the district is a lots of growth, um, not quite up to where we'd like them in, in performance. Not because people aren't working hard. When I walk through the halls of the elementary, middle school, high school, all I see is, is hard work. Um, but you know, we, we're behind for many reasons, pandemic, others. Um, and so that's sort of a story of the district as well. So Go, the underneath ahead. line was the beginning of the year? Yes. And the, the bigger line is February? February. Yes, the yeah, last... So we had growth, we have less red, we have more green. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
knowing that assessment tools have changed, do you comp have anything that compares this to pre-COVID, where kids I, were on, co on I do grade not, level versus today? Not at my fingertips, but yes. Um, and I could get that for you as well. This is the first time that fifth grade has taken the test. Of, um, this was one of the purposes of bringing iReady into fifth grade was so, so that um, when, they, when they enter Runlet, yep. they, the teachers are prepared with data, student performance data, mm -hmm. and can adjust um, instruction accordingly and track ins instruction accord accordingly. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and uh, it takes a little while to get proficient with the assess taking the assessment as a fifth grader. So I kind of give a little bit of grace until we have the tool in place for you know, a full school year. Yeah. The general nationwide picture is that you saw um, a little bit rising scores as you went towards the pandemic. Unsurprisingly, you saw a bit of a dip and things are coming back up. Mm -hmm. So there is iReady national data um, oh. that that we could look at, but as Kim said, it wouldn't be specific. To but we don't have iReady data for Concord prior to the pandemic. It, exactly. So the data you have is from PACE? When no, you said I'm you saying, had data, I'm what saying we, like if you look at iReady's national oh, right. results, but, right? But yeah, so we don't have, uh, and we don't have anything comparable right. for Concord. The change in Concord has been that we used uh, this data from iReady along with our um, SAS scores, which is our state assessment, which our youngsters are taking right now, as well as the data that teachers have around benchmark from the especially from the reading program so mm -hmm. um, yeah it's a little bit harder to do that I think what the only tool we have that is consistent would be the the state assessment didn't, I, didn't we have a presentation like a year and a half ago about how they changed all the state assessments well they changed they were, the pre and they, they were comparable well, well <laughs> it, they have and so you only can go back a year or two with that state assessment because you're right they changed yeah. it from smarter balance to this yeah. new state assessment, so. And, and that's been our focus of why I ready. I think that's the answer to why yeah. why we put I ready in place, why we push to put it down, um, in, you know, um, you know, in fifth grade, and uh, hopefully maybe even lower, and then fourth grade, um, in ninth grade. So we have that good transition right. into middle and out of middle and into the high school. So it's Great. a way to collect some standardized data and do that. And does this and make it so that when we're comparing, like I can remember being in this faculty meetings and this was our lowest ever fifth grade scores well it's a different group of kids you can't right. compare this year's fifth graders to last year's so we can follow the like this last year's fifth graders were here and now the sixth graders are here so it makes more yeah we're okay. looking at the mm -hmm. same kids yeah they'll go to fifth grade we'll yeah. have data for next year fifth and the sixth and sixth and the seventh well, this this data will follow them all the way through ninth grade Got it. so we'll be able to look at some longitudinal data about what has been their their progressive growth yeah. over time cool. well and we did that we provided a report um because my daughter's in ninth grade, um, that showed three years of iReady um, for ninth grade teachers. So that was distributed to ninth grade teams, the math teacher, so that when they were ready at the beginning of the year, as a part of what they can know about the child, that was part of the story. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be able to continue that, to have you know, now ninth graders, the, now the transition they'll have several more years of, of information on that. And, and again, back in my world, we get to the point of a kid we're concerned about um, and looking at um, you know, a possible referral. We're, we're going in with information that's longitudinal now and saying, okay, this kid has had trouble and struggled over multiple years and we have data that's right. standardized to look at that prior to making decisions move forward to assess. Mm -hmm. So this one is a little complicated. On the left-hand side, you see median typical growth achieved. So if you remember back to math, median is the middle person. So if you line up 100 kids, the middle person is either 49 or 50. But that kid, what, what you'd be seeing is the middle student's score. So some students will have grown tremendously. If you were only supposed to grow seven points and you grew 70 points, your growth comes out as you know, way above 100% growth, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and some students had some lower growth. 
So if you didn't meet your growth, your growth might be, you know, 1%, 2%, something like that. So this is growth on iReady, just to be clear. Yeah. The red box shows high performance, high growth. So that would be ideal. That's in a perfect world where everyone is healthy and happy and comes to school 97% of the time and um, well no, one, no one's ever sick and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the left, if you can't be in the red box, you want to be in the blue box. And that's lower performance, meaning in terms of getting to where you wanna be, because that's how iReady works. They, it's a grade level model. So they're saying, are you doing grade level work? Um, so if you're, if you're not in the red box, we wanna be in the blue box. Does that make some sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is math iReady. These are all grades together. So this is a district picture. And the top dot is eighth grade. Okay. Um, the seven, six, and five is there. And it, this presents us with some obvious areas for improvement, growth in our own right. And this is why, as John was saying, or as Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, you confront the reality that is in front of you. And um, this is not exactly where we'd want to be, but this is where we are. Okay, in January. In January, yeah. So, fifth, gr fifth grade, the median growth was? 30%. And in eighth grade, it was 80%? Yeah. Okay. So, what you're seeing there, and uh, Kathleen noted this wisely on Friday, we had an iReady person in, um, that's really good in terms of growing. If we're worried about kids coming back or getting back, we, we want there to be, we obviously want there to be high performance, but we want them to be uh, growing. Um, so that's, that's what that is. We'll have SAS date, or SAS, SAT, <laughs> SAT, SAS, we will have SAT data for you. They just finished. Mm -hmm. Kyleen Chalaskis and I were working very hard to get, uh, at the high school, uh, uh, interesting challenge is getting 95% of kids to um, do the SAT. That's a federal law, it's that you have to get to 95%. That's not as big of a deal with um, elementary and middle school. But with high school, uh, there are folks that, um, you know, they're already on other paths in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're graduating through high set, um, and it's it can be a challenge. Um, and Kylene's done an amazing job trying to get them in. And do you understand why they set those parameters on that? They want 95% because if you have less than 95%, then the difference between the no number yeah. that you have and 95%, let's say it's 3% of the kids didn't take it, those scores are zero. So they really so do affect you. Yeah, right. they affect mm -hmm. the and, um, and also they want to make sure that you make every effort to test everyone because you could, I suppose, recommend that children stay home if you didn't have a threshold that they had to meet. So they set it at 95 so that every school works to get kids in school to take that test. Interesting. Yeah. I wanted to give you some examples of um, uh, meetings in February. Um, so here in the pie chart, you can see that yellow, red is below where you'd like to be on that F and P, remember the A to Z. Yeah. Um, yellow is approaching. Green is on, blue is above. Their goal was 85% on or above. They accomplished 75. Um, and so they bumped up their goal to 86 by the end of the year. Um, and then they said that 71% uh, of students below grade level are receiving some kind of intervention to help them uh, make their way back. So that's an example of, like I was saying, we went through every grade, every school, kindergarten through, 12th grade with those. Mm -hmm. So again, here is the district picture of 
what you're going to see. And if you look at uh, 1,097 students and you see um, the bands of red getting slightly smaller, I'm told by reading specialists that's pretty much the order you learn them in. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty traditional to see them yeah. increasing green that way. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I really like about this information is that by, by dig, and we're going to be working with our teachers to dig down in those areas. So if I'm a classroom teacher, I know that I need to work harder on informational texts. Okay, because I have more students mm -hmm. who um, who Can't are down do in that lower yeah. end, yeah. and so that means that I need to use more um, uh, nonfiction. Make sure I'm using social studies, science uh, for reading materials across all content areas, not just in the science you use science, mm -hmm. right? But if I'm doing literature, I want to make sure that it has a a science background or a social studies background, and sense. also be able to dig down on the skills that make up informational text, mm -hmm. you know, comprehension, um, and you know, analyzing, uh, cause and effect, all of those skills around informational text, mm -hmm. the teacher can then dig down on and make sure the youngsters have that skill. They absolutely need that skill um, when they move on, um, mm -hmm. especially when they move into middle and high school. So I'm going to try and wrap up in five, just because of your time parameters. Um, here's that view again of, and here we have eight at the top this time, five is there in reading. Wow. So they're okay in reading. Mm -hmm. There is uh, six, and that's seventh grade. So it goes eight, five, eight, six, five. Seven. So there was six, big seven. growth for the... Yeah, so we're, we're definitely in the high growth category. Um, you know, this is um, obviously re really great growth. It's close to the high performance, high growth. Um, so a, a little brighter picture than math. So social, emotional, and attendance, we'll finish up with that. Uh, everyone had a goal of some kind related to um, the social emotional health. It's not that we didn't before the pandemic. It's just we really, really want to make sure we have that now. Uh, John and Janine uh, Richards' work uh, was instrumental in, in helping this. And we got another new tool called Sabres, which is the Social Academic Emotional Behavior Risk Screener. Um, and it's a norm referenced, uh, or it's a, it's a tool that is scientifically based, uh, double blind, like a scientific study, um, and can really help us as a starting point on where kids are. And this is done by teachers. teachers yes. have a survey they do about each of their kids. Oh, okay. And it takes about, how would you say, not, not long? About 90 seconds per child. Yeah, it's very oh. short and quick, okay. and it's just to answer a few questions about their child, and if this is a good risk factor, is what it is about where they are, yeah. and it's just a screen. Yeah. Which is across the entire district. So and, and really, we've been clear that by screener, it, it isn't the end-all, be-all. It doesn't prescribe anything. It just narrows in on, you might want to double-check this individual. And so it, it is that entry point. And, it's not a, and, and, and the thing about this we did for all kids, cause it's not always about just the student who may act out or behave or, or that forward behavior. It's those recessive behaviors, too, that we want to make sure we're watching mm -hmm. and those withdrawals and things like that that yes. are different changes. We want to make sure we're tracking them yeah. that, too. Oh, sorry. Um, so dark pinkish is high risk. Um, pink is some risk. Light bluish or lavender is low risk. Um, and so this is the whole district. We did this in... Um, fall and winter, and this is, um, if you look at the whole district, 112 looks high, but that is in on track with a sort of a national triangle of, of where people are at this point. Um, 
So we didn't have something where the, the high risk was 15% or something like that. So this is about, I don't want to say what it should be, that sounds too cold, but this is, this is about where we can find a manageable way of looking at this. And if you take that 112 and divide it into seven buildings and you think of the professionals that are there, yeah. they knew every one, one of those children mm -hmm. and a lot of them were being helped already. Um, if you look at the sum risk, some of those identified, and that's what John was saying, some of those identified, oh, like terrific grades, maybe, wow, they're, they're reticent, um, they may have an emotional thing. So it allows teachers and school leaders to double check on that, make sure, um, and then lo large numbers of, of low risk students. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? We could, I didn't go grade by grade, we certainly could. It's, it's not a widely different picture if I went through all 12 grades. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I originally had 12 more slides, but I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. So, Appreciate your uh, discernment. <laughs> and again, you know, you're talking almost, you know, over 500 kids that are at some risk or high. It's, it's, it's where we are. Um, but it shows that, that a lot of the effort we put in around our, you know, working with Janine as the director of, you know, of student staff wellness, why? There's a, there's a lot there and there's a need for that, that effort and the work she's doing around helping us kind of align our efforts with our multi-tier system across the district, making sure interventions are in place, making sure we're accessing the resources in and out of schools. Mm -hmm. All of our, our, our community partnerships we're doing with other agencies such as Riverbend, those are all really important right now. And I think this is data supports that, yeah, we're on track and we, we have identified the population of kids that we're trying to really help. And then the universal part that you'll hear more about in the future, our SEL work that we're doing um, in the conference. Um, lastly, um, Kim sort of guided us through looking at attendance. We looked at attendance last year. The story of attendance last year was this gigantic spike starting around <laughs> Thanksgiving where you saw numbers go really high. Yeah. The story of last year was 80 to 85 percent attendance each day. That's unheard of in an elementary level pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. Elementary is 95, 97 every day. Um, at the high school, you know, having a day where, you know, you look at it daily and it's 82% of kids there. For you who went to the high school, that's 212 missing kids. Well, I'm not the best because I missed a lot of school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's get, do we have his permanent file? Yeah. Um, yes, we do. <laughs> um, Mine's so in the Smithsonian. What we, what we checked, we checked on uh, returning from February break to now. And so um, overall this year, attendance is much better. We did not see the Thanksgiving spike in attendance. It was a much, much flatter. We're still not where we want to be exactly, but if you look at elementaries, that's every day how many percent of kids were out. So most of those bars under 6%. And you see that trend line going down. Um, You'll see the trend line here at Runlet is going up, but that is only recently after. In terms of their whole year of attendance, it's way down, much better. You see those numbers. Uh, they're still around 8%. We'd love it to be down closer to 4 or 5. Um, so don't misread that trend line as bad news about Runlet, that's just where they are as, as of this point. Attendance at Runlet is way better this year and they've done amazing work. Um, and one of our PLCs that we did with all principals was looking at attendance a little bit differently. It, it used to be you get an angry, not an angry level, you get a stern letter, your child's not coming to school, they must come to school, or the truancy officer. Um, We've tried to have many more, again, research-based approaches to how do we really get this child back? Because a lot of it is they're not sick in the traditional way. Uh, their parents can't get them to school, things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. CHS is trending a little bit down. You see that they get a trend line down, but notice also those numbers are higher than we'd like them to be on any day you know, nosing towards 15% of kids out, 
that's better than 20% out, but we we really want high school attendance to be close to 95%. They all have vacation early on this day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just checking yeah. That, you know? yeah. That's exactly what yeah. it is. That. Yeah. Exactly yeah. Plane left. Do, uh, it was, do we know how many of these days, and obviously that would be hard information to collect, are related to mental health challenges? So there's a correlation, and the answer is yes. We, we <laughs> yeah. do know. Um, so all those students that we just talked about, Sabres, one of the reasons doing it to make correlation between data with grades, Mul multi factors. What, why is the kid struggling? Like, where are they academically? Where are they socially? Where are they attendance wise? It all comes to a kid's profile, which helps us target our intervention more and get involved. And the, the reason why we do have um, our social workers and, 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 and people in the building to try to do some of this a little more home visiting, a little more to get involved and help the parents that struggle getting kids to school and providing resources and partnering with Riverbend and other people that are trying to help us work with this population. Do we have anything in place? I mean, years ago, you know, Walker was a walk, everyone could walk to school. So if kids weren't there and they just couldn't get there, we'd go get them, you know? Somebody who had a planning period would go get the kids, which of course can't happen anymore, but then we'd send Mr. Simpson to get them. But is there a, is there a way if a kid wants to come to school, but you know who knows where mom or dad is or whatever, and they missed a bus or whatever? Do we have ways to go get them? We do. We still okay. do. We work with them. We okay. do. We work with them, and that's the reason for some of what you've seen around us um, adding. You know, um, we use our ESSER funds for social workers. We do right. a lot of things to try to okay. get the population yeah. for that reason. Right. You know, involve them in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is some of it just the line of when you keep your a child who may be sick home has moved, you know. Yeah. So there were days I'm not proud of where there was a little Tylenol and let's hope daycare doesn't yeah. call until I get through my meeting. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And you know I don't do that anymore, and I know a lot of people don't do that. So anymore. there's part of the research that the research-based studies through this uh, online group called Attendance Works is informing parents of where their child is in relation to like a percentage. Mm -hmm. And so at the high school, their version of it was they sent something home and they said, your child has been absent X number of times. What we say at this point of year would be a normal number was this. Mm -hmm. And so to give parents that, um, because you're exactly right, that line has moved and we don't want anyone who's sick to be in school who's truly sick. but. The idea of chronic absenteeism, yeah. like you're, you may be sick every day, but you've missed 13 days. And missing 13 high school days often leads to not passing the classes that you're in. Mm -hmm. And so having that type. And what came back to it, this, the way the letters were written this year and the communication was to spur conversation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't with, written to be punitive, which more of like, you know, do this or else. It was more of a very friendly opening the door. And in that, some parents, for example, I was talking in high school, one of the person has some dental work. The kid had some major dental work to be done. Mm -hmm. Set an appointment at the same time every week. He had like consecutive six weeks of being out mm -hmm. and missed the same class six weeks. Uh, and yeah. as a parent, I wouldn't have thought of that. Yep. I would have said, well, it just makes sense. Doctor can do it. Yeah, go. But missed six math classes in a row. And, and, right. and they're talking about, do you know what it's like to miss six math classes and how far behind he's going to be lacking that much instruction? Yeah. Those conversations were spurred, but sometimes just making awareness of that. Is what and, and, and picking up from Pam's point, I, that's why I asked about the mental health challenges, because I know emphasis on mental health days has increased, and I know in high school that as well in my family, mm -hmm. that sometimes that would be the same thing as when you take a sick day or a day off, so I'm just curious. That's that. how it is in my house, yeah. too. My kiddos are young, but I'm trying to normalize mental health care as part of, you know, uh, self-care and wellness overall and I know that the district prioritizes that as well too. When I think that's where the thinking of absenteeism not as a, a sick day or just a you know factually your child has been out this number so that yeah. you can then make that decision as a parent. Right. Um, wow I we did we did a sort of mental health day what you know you think with your child about are we what do we really need today? Right, right. right. And, and if you have done those things, that when the day early for Disney comes on, you <laughs> say, I've already yeah. taken these other days away. Right, right. Maybe it's not a good idea to leave on 
Friday for Disney. Maybe I should wait till Saturday. Yeah. You know, and, that, and those are the factors that you got to play into this a little bit. Yeah, for sure. So, just to sum up, I mean, I think we've covered it. The schools did a great job setting data. We've checked in to support them, um, and they've really taken so, specific help uh, steps to uh, address their data. So yeah. that's it. Thank you, Tom. This is big lifting. Thank you. Very heavy lifting. Lots and very of help. difficult to <laughs> narrow down into a space in where. Telephoto, here you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the data is only as good as the work that we do after we have yes. this data. Um, and I think both Kim and Tom alluded to the PLCs. That means we're bringing our principals in in a professional learning community, principals meeting. Um, but um, we're that, this is what we're talking about, so that it goes back to their buildings, to their staff, and they see the data. So mm -hmm. the data is shared with them, and they discuss the issues, whether it's social emotional, whether it's attendance, mm -hmm. or whether it's the reading and math. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think those are really important um, facets to the work that we do. And um, the nice part is, is that we're trying to standardize it. You know, we're trying to be a K, a K, a pre-K uh, 12 school district, not silos of different schools doing different things. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. I'm just wondering how this information is shared with parents. Um, you know, the um, my memory is they get the SAS scores the year after, so sometime into the next school year you get the SAS scores, but. You know, as a parent, I think it would be helpful to know going into the summer where my kid needs to be focused. You know, if I can get them to do one school-related thing over the summer, where should I focus my energy? And so this year you'll get SAS scores uh, by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, fifth grade through ninth grade will get iReady before the end of the year, okay. report cards before the end of the year. There's a new online parent portal that we will give folks the app option to use um, where you, you get a little um, login for your child and you can go online to look at New Hampshire SAS scores. Um, and that's actually a fairly nice interface. You can dig down a little bit into exactly what type of skill they may have missed. Um, so that's, that's the data that we'll provide. Um, you know, and that'll be before the school year ends? It'll, with elementary, it'll go out with report cards, um, and middle school probably report cards too, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. The only problem I see with that is once the report cards go out, there's no one around to ask any questions if mm. you have, if you don't, if you want to understand the data a little bit more. So I, I think just to think about that, like sending it home on the last day of school, means that you can't, your child's teacher is gone and you can't circle back. Let me talk with Kim and the principals because it's, it's, it's a possibility that we could use our messaging system to send the SAS code. Um, so yeah, let, Kim and I will follow up on that. Good idea. Uh, the only other issue I have with uh, sending those reports home blindly like that mm -hmm. is understanding the data. Right. And so um, we need to think about a way to help parents understand what those reports mean. Uh -huh. I mean, it, 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 we, we see this stuff all the time, so it's like nothing to us. Uh -huh. But it, you know, a parent gets a report, you, you really don't. I think we need to do, uh, I think you and I talked a little bit about that, about some way of communicating to the families, hey, this is what the, when you see this on the I ready, that's, this is what it means. And when you look at the SAS state scores and it breaks it down and um, we'll, you know, we can, I think we need to do some of that, Pam. I, I think well, it's going to be important. Well, and I think for parents to understand, you know, because there will, there could potentially be complex, you know, I know of a parent whose child has been on the Fontes and Pinnell reading, you know, several letters above grade level all time, and then the SAS scores came back and it was a one mm -hmm. on reading. Actual reading. <laughs> so does that mean my kid can't Sorry. read? Does that mean my kid just blew off the, the SAS, a combination of the, of the two? And I think having, you know, that ability yeah. to understand that. Something that could be nice, uh, John, remember you did the... Uh, 
sort of a special education evening and invited me oh, awesome. one time to talk about um, and yeah. we, we could do a live version we could do in person so you know you could you know live is live live and zoom mm -hmm. so you could join in and ask some general questions and then if you had student specific we could you know point people in the right direction I'd like that and idea we could film it and post it yeah uh, we could mm -hmm. cut, record it and post it yeah. after. That, I like that by doing a zoom meeting that way you have your video right there. You can just mm -hmm. look at and we may get more people involved in it too, you know, yeah. especially as the spring comes with t-ball and baseball and lacrosse and everything else the kids are doing. Yeah, that's a good idea. I like that. Yeah. Kim I, and I will work on it. I think it's an important reminder for folks who might be watching and aren't in this room and maybe aren't tied to uh, the district in the way that we're all privileged to understand the way educating works I mean not to say that I know that as well as you all do but um, you can't divorce this data from the general community mm -hmm. and that everything is curriculum and these results are not totally dependent on the ways that our teachers perform in classrooms it has everything to do with the engagement of families um, the participation of parents in their children's education and the way that the community has buy-in in our district um, so if folks are, you know, concerned about slow growth, low performance, uh, that has everything to do with the way the community engages around our district. Um, and so any, you know, slide in performance really can't be laid just at the feet of the district. Everything is curriculum. Wherever you are in your community makes a difference in how kiddos um, perform when they get to school. They're not boxes that you just put blocks into. You know, they're people with very, with really varied and complex experiences, and I'm really great at reading books with my kids. I am not really great about doing math with them at home. So I can completely understand why we would have slow math rates, because I know I'm not a unique <laughs> style of parent. Especially during COVID. Especially during COVID. It was much, I feel that it's, it's much more um, tangible for me to be teaching my kiddos reading skills as opposed to math skills. So we really need buy-in from the very general community about how we approach and support our district at large if they find anything here concerning we all have to have buy-in on it did i hear education funding sarah <laughs> maybe <laughs> thanks tom thank you thanks tom okay professional development is the last on our list who gets to yap about that kim um, john and i are going to talk about professional development very briefly um but just a, a highlight of the year we started the year with some professional development time in august and um, I have to say that we really um, had a lot of mandatory trainings and we will every year do those annual mandatory trainings um, that teachers have to participate in and that is around Title IX training, um, sexual harassment, bullying training, homeless. homeless training, suicide prevention training, mm -hmm. and in some cases CPR training, and in other cases CPI which has to do with um, how to de-escalate students. So when I when we lay it all out, I go, yikes. Like, well, how am I going to fit in all of this great innovative <laughs> professional development, personal learning? October, um, we focused on training, uh, early in the year, we focused on training for the teachers who were new to Foundations and to Hegarty or other programs that they needed to get up and running. Um, yeah, the tricky thing about October is that it competes with the NEA um, conference, so mm -hmm. it's unpredictable if we want something that we want all people to be trained in. Um, we have competing, you know, competing um, activities happening through the association. Um, so that's a tough day. So the, the, the big story of this is that March um, 17th, we created a professional development day that um, was really exciting and we sent out surveys and surveys that are were typically in twos and threes around out of a scale of five for um, people. Uh, professional staff feedback were fours and fives across the board. It's maybe what, as low as a 3.5, but um, March 17th ended up being a really productive day. And um, I do, we do have a monthly professional development committee that meets with us and we work on planning for the day. So there's teacher buy-in, there's ed assistance buy-in, there's administrator buy-in, um, and we plan it together. So this isn't about what Kim and John wanted to plan, um, although we did have some initiatives that needed to be addressed, for example, around the foundation.
positions. And um, I ready training was another training that we had to get in for all the fifth grade teachers. Um, we have a vision for um, going forward to uh, redo our re elementary report card over the summer. So uh, that's going to equate professional development in the fall. So there are some things that are initiative based and s some things that are um, out of surveys that we've done to staff and or the professional development committee has come up with that. So on, um, since, since we didn't have competing factors on March 17th and um, there was more time to understand where the district was from my point of view as just starting here, what were the major initiatives around social emotional learning um, around um, implementing iReady and around um, initiatives that were already in place. For example, Universal Design for Learning is also called UDL, and it was something that the high school has been heavily involved in, and they needed mm -hmm. to not drop that initiative. Another example would be um, restorative justice and restorative practices. That's an initiative at the high school. It's seeping down into the runlet and into the elementary. We don't want, it, nothing's worse um, for educators to see an initiative come and go, just like that. Yep. It needs sustainability yep. over time. So March 17th was around those initiatives that were in place, and John's gonna talk a little bit about what came, we came up with for EAs on that day, and I'll talk about. Yeah. Oh, you have it in your, you have it in front of you. Oh. And then, um, you know, and another couple of just more about uh, professional staff too in our, in our um, things. We did some work around um, our English language learners and also some work on diversity too that happened within the district. Some of the things we've been, we've been working on and, and to keep that, that, that continual flow always going in front of our, our educators. But um, part of planning too is I met with, um, Kim and I met with um, the, the presidents of the, um, of the CEAA, our, our support team, uh, support staff, and um, also included our tutors, and uh, took some time to say, kind of, what are your needs? And we did a little bit of a need assessment with them and talked about them, and they really wanted to, to focus on tools that really um, help them with kids that were dysregulated in the classroom. They wanted to walk away with tangible things, and um, you know, you'll, you'll see from my handout there was, um, things really around um, support the supporters. Mm -hmm. We did a, a training around incident command, um, in, um, try to incidents that may happen in schools, craze training, our, our concrete PD came in and worked with our, our, our staff to do a big training around that. Um, more around really about what kids bring to school and their backpacks every day, a, a training called Sally's Story. It's a, a presenter we brought in to really talk about you know, why we did the Sabres training and all that, and then talked about what are some warning signs and what do you need to know. Um, Karen Baxter and uh, Sin Fish did a real nice job. They're two educators in our district, and they did a really, really nice job about just things they do every day with kids to help regulate them. You know, movement breaks, um, you know, uh, beat sticks, all kinds of things. It was a fun, I sat in it, it was a fun, really interactive workshop with that. Um, you know, and then um, Stacy Lazard and Janine, Janine did a uh, real thing about supporting our most vulnerable kids who are homeless. We did some work around that with, with our educators. And then um, just building relationships and understanding um, how to work with kids and start developing relationships. So there was a uh, pretty well attended. I think that I left you some numbers about who was in each workshop. I was going to ask if that was how many attended. Yeah, that's yeah. who attended each workshop, just to kind of give you a feeling of, you know, and it was optional. This, this isn't oh, a day okay. that's required for these people. This, this is really just This around. is the educational assistant. Educational assistant mm -hmm. yeah. and tutors. Yeah. And it was, it was something that was optional. I was pretty happy with the turnout. We yeah. had over 50, um, 50, 50 uh, come in and uh, take part in the day, and uh, it was really engaging, and like I said, the scores were uh, very high, um, I think, for um, their appreciation. And um, I really appreciated that educators stepped up too to train others. That was nice to see too. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, you know, my two years, the first time I had that outflow, people wanted to do it. So it's starting to take shape. Kim talked about the professional development committee. We probably had one of the most productive meetings last week with that group. They really were all engaged. When you run a group and everyone else in the room just speaks and you kind of got to sit there and just watch them talk to each other and talk about what they like, what they would improve, what their thoughts are for next year. Mm. It was really nice. It's starting to 
really take some uh, leadership and ownership of the bigger professional development team we're starting to see come in place. That's and, great. And our next goal is to uh, want to talk about kind of what our goals for that committee are coming up about creating a calendar for next year. So um, by the June um, instructional committee meeting, we'll present you uh, a, um, a full calendar for the entire year of what the professional development will be, which will be a huge relief on my part because coming in July and saying, okay, Concrete, what do you need? <laughs> it was a little bit challenging. And so we're, we're going to be um, front loading all of the professional development days and uh, the activities. And we're going to stick with current initiatives um, with a few outliers that um, came, came about. Um, one of the ways that we structured March 17th, and this goes to Kathleen's point about trying to take away silos, is at Millbrook and Broken Ground, every single pre-K through fifth grade teacher were in that building. And they rotated through, um, they had a choice of three different activities, and then everyone was required to do the work on competencies. So we had two sessions of competencies and everyone had to go and visit that, in which, in which we had a, a consultant from um, the, the New Hampshire uh, Learning Institute. Yeah, learn, okay, and, yeah, Learning Institute. Yeah. And uh, nonetheless, um, the afternoon, what was, which was really exciting, was administrators, um, teacher leaders, um, let's see, uh, coordinators, mm -hmm. um, every group, read an article and participate in what we call a professional learning community. So first they developed norms for their group, they read this article, they reflected on essentially how do we reinvent, reimagine education post-COVID? What, what kind of teaching techniques, instructional practices should we get rid of? And how do we best um, look at our learners currently and say what, is the, what are the best tools to meet their needs, looking at some some research and some data around what are the most effective instructional practices. So everybody read the same article. And then when I say that the, the, when I talk about these groups, I'm talking about the sixth grade through 12th grade content area people all met together. So all the math teachers met sixth grade through 12th. That hasn't happened in a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. All of the world language teachers met six through 12th. All of the ELA teachers met 6 through 12 and was facilitated. As a matter of fact, Mike Reardon facilitated the ELA group. So there was heavy, heavy involvement by the administration. And then, likewise, at the pre-K through, well, pre-K, let's say K through 5 group, they pre-K met as a cohort across buildings. But at the K through 5, all K teachers across the district met and had a facilitator for that group. Ooh, that's cool. And read the same article as the as the teachers who were reading, who taught physics at mm -hmm. the high school. They were reading the exact same article, engaging in reflective conversation, um, and then just having time to talk about what's working and what what kind of practices they should uh, would want to leave behind. Um, so I say this because the feedback was tremendous. It was resounding, right, John? from the surveys that they want to continue with this model going forward. They want to visit each other's classrooms across the district. They want to meet with their grade level colleagues across the district. They want to continue having these professional dialogues. Prior to, prior to this taking place, I met with all of the facilitators and guided them through what, to, what it's going to look like and talked about what it's not going to look like. This is not going to be a, you know, a griping time. This is not going to be like, you know, you have that resource. I don't have that resource. Why do you have the resource? I talked about creating parking lots and that this is mm. professional dialogue. It's not if you have something to say, validate it, but let's put it on a parking lot and let's keep this at a high level. Um, so we know going forward that we need to have more of these professional learning communities across the district and that, that we will put them in going forward for next year. As yeah. someone with a lot of di history in the district, when I first arrived here, um, it was building-based management completely. So your education depended really on where you went to school, mm -hmm. what you got taught, whether or not you learned cursive, how much special ed support was in the building. It was really, really bizarre. So it was really easy to get very territorial building to building. This is such a good thing. Thank you. Because you're a kindergarten teacher in Concord, regardless of your building. Mm -hmm. You have resources and support and communication it's really, really, that's, yeah. this is, 
It, it led us to two is I think that special educators got together K through five and then six through 12. Um, and um, OT all got to, OT's got, occupational therapists got together and speech and language pathologists got together in their groups too. Again, same article, same theme, but then we really got into a lot of conversations around specially designed instruction. And that's huge. So it's led us to next year really to how do we, how do we really take that forward? Some well, kind they of. They bring their populations into right, it as well. So, so right. there could be 50 more, aha moments that yeah. you wouldn't think of with your own little school worth of kindergarten. And, and more graduates. articles, more education around that, and then into further training. This is going to spur from these groups what do they need for professional development? Where are their, where are their areas they want to learn more about and strengthen their skills? And that's going to come from them in these groups, which is really, I think, important. Yeah. It's that there's self kind of some self direction and some leadership between our PD committee and their feedback is yeah. going to lead us in a much better place. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, so, as far as those professional learning groups, did you get feedback from the educators directly, sort of like in survey form? that allowed you to sort of compile their mm -hmm. feedback? Yeah, and that's where we came up with the, I have to say, those all got fives. Awesome. With the exception of one facilitator. They were, everyone loved them. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just a good direction for our district. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, You're way welcome. to go, team. You're welcome. I'm killing it. Thank you for your time this evening. You got it. Is there anything else? that might have magically been left off the agenda that we need to discuss. No, nice, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, good night everybody.